Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to be here. So, my title. Uh, as I'm going to explain to you, my name's Michael. I'm going to give you some introductions. When I was asked to write this one, I suddenly realised I've been at VMRay for just about a year. Now, I started at VMRay a year ago, relatively basic when it comes to sandboxing. So the theme of this is to pull in what I've learned, what I've discovered, what I've come across in the first year, and of course tell you a lot about VMRay. And hopefully, even if you're not interested in VMRay, there's going to be some things of value to you. So, introductions first. Like I said, my name is Michael. About 20 years ago, I started in systems administration. I moved into architecture, cybersecurity, so on and so forth, and I've ended up as a sales engineer. So for those of you that aren't aware, a sales engineer, actually I'm quite sure you all are, but a sales engineer, such as myself, is a resource. If you're interested in a product like VMRay, I'm available to you to make this system work with anything you've got, integrations and things like that. So this past year, I've been doing demonstrations for customers, as I've probably done for some of you this afternoon. Showed you the product, discussed it. After that, we go on site with the customer, we start installing it, and we start understanding the problems they've got, why they were interested in a malware sandbox. And that's the basis of what I'm going to be talking about today. So a little bit about VMRay, the company I work for, the company I'm representing today. Our two founders, Carsten and Ralph, met on top of a mountain. I love that line because it genuinely, apparently, is completely true. They tell me so. They both previously developed sandboxes, so this was a part of their PhD program. And in 2013, they wrote a paper about doing malware analysis from outside a virtual machine looking in. That was the basis of their PhD programs. They are both now doctors, so it seemed to have gone well. It's gone even better because in the last 10 years, it's grown. I think 100 plus is quite a low estimate. I think we're about 150. They call it the most comprehensive and accurate solution for automated detection and analysis of advanced threats. That's a hell of a mouthful, so let me explain it to you a bit differently. Like I said to you, this is about monitoring malware, monitoring files from outside the hypervisor. Traditional sandboxes, and this is probably about a good 75% of the market, the ones that I come across, they're agent-based. Within the sandbox contains an agent, a piece of software that is going to monitor the sample you launch and, of course, report everything back to you. Now, that's fantastic. Very easy to develop, very cheap to run, but malware can spot an agent. Malware can detect import address table hooking. So suddenly, people with agent-based sandboxes may get a very, very, uh, you know, a very great tool but there's always a lot that it won't be able to do. Malware, very advanced malware, can detect it. And of course, any, of, any agent type software is going to require a little bit of pre-knowledge. It's going to need to know what things to monitor in order to be able to detect. So what Carsten and Ralph came up with is VMRay. They're on the right, agentless. Our virtual machines appear to be just a plain Windows install. I mean, we do a lot to make them look realistic. You can have a look, if you ever want to have a look at one of our threat reports, we dump out all sorts of data, Word documents, make it look like a user's been there. But at the same time, there's nothing in there that is monitoring the malware. So when these pieces of malware launch these unknown files, zero days, anything you can think of, they're going to run, and they're going to run to their full extent. If there's nothing to detect they're being analysed, they're usually going to show off their true colours. So. We get a lot of information, we get a lot of sort of stuff from that. Now, I said to you, um, a few people I talked to, I wanted to make this as valuable as possible. If you're interested about how malware analysis is most commonly done in other sandboxes, Learning Malware Analysis by Packet Publishing, fantastic book, but it goes into import address table hooking very, very well. And I do think if anyone's looking at sandboxing in a critical sense, you need to understand the agent technology that's running this. Import address table hooking, it has its flaws. I won't be going into it today because it is a very, very in-depth subject. But as I said, learning malware analysis, that book is fantastic. So, we all need to go and benchmark our sandboxes. Why do I say this? Which one have you got? Have we got the smiley, happy children on the left or this horrible, stinking pile on the right? Why I say this is because, again, in the year that I've worked for VMRay, 
I'm used to people break, breaking bits of software. I'm used to them testing it. How many times have you ever heard someone benchmarking their sandbox? I come across it very, very rarely. Quite shockingly so. Because these are the type of things that VMware will report back. Now, again, I'm not a salesperson, so I'm going to focus on this slide outside of the realm of things like Jonathan can help you with later. First pointer on this slide I'd like to draw your attention to, up at the top, threatfeed.vmray.com. You do not need to register to go and have a look at that page. And I'd recommend anyone who's curious about what VMray can do, go and have a look there. Our labs team go out in the wild, they find these awful samples, send them through VMray, and then they publish a report for people to come and have a look at. So if you're at all curious, have a look at that threat feed URL. However, I took these samples from that analysis mentioned there. Now, we see these anti-analysis artifacts, these anti-analysis signals, constantly. In the year I've been at VMRay, I would say at least 50% of the samples that I've put through VMRay show some indication they're trying to detect whether they're being analysed. Now, to look at these, as you can see here, tries to detect a debugger, makes direct system calls to evade hooking-based sandboxes, and down there enumerates running processes. So let's focus on this slide just for one minute. If we launch this sample in, let's say, um, I don't know, VirtualBox, if we just installed Windows, vanilla Windows, we thought we're a bit nervous of this sample, let's launch it inside there. Yeah, OK, it would probably run. We haven't got anything there that it's trying to look for antivirus or things like that. Detecting the debugger, I'm guessing that if it finds one, this piece of malware is going to change its behavior. So if you were to launch this in your own sandbox, or you found this sample and you were curious to see if you could sort of do what VMRAID does, go and have a play around. But detecting a debugger, I guarantee you, if that was there, it's going to shut down. Making the direct system calls, again, all of that would probably have been missed by a traditional type of sandbox. So these anti-analysis things, these queries that are being made, of course, that's it trying to evade detection. These are things that wouldn't be showing up on another sandbox system. And then down at the bottom, the running processes. This is another really important thing. If you were to go and build your own sandbox, you need to make it look realistic. It's surprising how many different pieces of malware we see do these kind of harmless little checks. I mean, would your EDR notice this? Would it notice that one process is just saying what's running? It seems quite harmless. But of course, to a piece of malware, it's looking to see, is this a realistic PC? I mean, how many users' PC launch, say, a Word document, and there's nothing else running, there's nothing else installed, it's a blank system, they installed Microsoft Office and then have started working. It's a little unrealistic. And as I'll be showing you later with some other samples, unfortunately some more modern samples, and this one I was targeting here, um, yes, processors will shut down, they'll misbehave, they'll do other things. So, on the subject of checking out your sandboxes, again, a little break from the sort of VMRay versus the technical discussion. When I started at VMRay, I'm used to using things like the iCar file to check antiviruses working. Everyone familiar with the iCar file? E-I-C-A-R? Perfect. Right, one guy, my pal. So the iCar file, if anyone's not aware of it, E-I-C-A-R. It's a harmless text file. You can email it to your friends and, of course, detect if any antivirus, any mail gateways or anything like that, flag up an alert. It is a harmless file, though. PA fish, paranoid fish. This is the equivalent for sandboxes. Now, I don't know if you can see there. I certainly can't. Some of you might have really good eyesight, though. But these slides will be available to you. Have a look at that GitHub repo, if not. But you can see here, that's it running inside a VMRay virtual machine. If you have a sandbox, if you, oh, sorry, put my teeth back in. If you have a sandbox currently, I would encourage each of you to go and run a tool like this. Now, it's open source, so of course, have a look at that GitHub repo. It's very easily written, and you'd be surprised at the type of things it's looking for. Number of CPUs. Who makes a CPU? Notice things like VMware, VirtualBox, advertise a VirtualBox virtual CPU. 
Of course, if a lot of malware sees that, it's going to shut down. So Paranoid Fish does an amazing job of benchmarking the system. It is not, it is absolutely not a VMRA tool. We are, I'm not trying to push you just another way. This isn't something sneaky. It is genuinely an open source project, which I have seen great things from. And I've always been surprised that a number of people using a free sandbox, they run this through and all of a sudden they get a little bit scared as to what it can and can't do. <sighs> so, let's go on to the meat and potatoes. This is my year in malware. So I started last year. Now, the first thing I came across, and like I said, I've probably got a career similar to a lot of people I've spoken to. Always worked in IT, moved from sort of systems administration and came into security about sort of 10 years ago, I'd say. In that time, I'd always use antivirus to alert me to the presence of something nasty. A few years ago, well, not a few years ago, sorry, it's even further now, companies start rolling out EDR. So now we can get these alerts and we can respond, and it's fantastic. But besides a few times that I maybe analysed bits of malware with something like IDA Pro or Oli Debugger, I never really spent a whole lot of time analysing malware. And if I'm honest, when I came to work with VMRay, I was sort of expecting a real sort of like the customer base would be real hardcore sort of geeky guys. And yet I'm quite surprised at how many different companies use us. So, why do you analyse malware? Number one, targeted attacks. They are getting cheaper by the day and easier and easier to run. I'm going to show you a few examples of these, but targeted attacks, um, when you look at the cost of a URL, when you look at the cost of repackaging, I mean, you can go onto GitHub and find some amazing software packaging tools. UPX is a very common one. There's a million different types of similar packers that will obfuscate and hide your code. Right, so all of a sudden, targeted attacks, you may actually want to know what's going on here. To alert you is great. You can block it, you can stop the threat. But to understand, what was I being targeted? Is this coming directly from me or have I just got unlucky? Zero day attacks. Um, this is a very, very bold statement and I completely back this up. Because VMRay does that behavioral analysis, and if we remember, because we don't use import address table hooking, we don't need to know in advance of the threats, we're able to catch an alert zero day malware. If a file starts encrypting all your files, we can alert you to that. So again, we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of larger organizations who are being hit by brand new attacks. Again, people are selling vulnerabilities, people are selling exploits. And unfortunately, if you spend a few thousand buying one, you're probably going to want to send it to someone who's got enough money maybe to pay a ransom. And unfortunately, these are the bigger companies. And then finally, malware intelligence providers. So again, something that fascinates me. We get all this information. You get these horrible pieces of malware that go looking for exploits in your system. They backdoor things. They ransom off your data. They exfiltrate. They do all these horrible things. But most of my career, I never really stopped to actually analyze and say, what are they looking for? And again, if you couple this with things like a targeted attack, well, it's probably a good idea to know what you're actually being hit with. It's nice to be able to block it. We all need to be able to block it. But yeah, going a step further. So what do we make the most of? As I said, ransomware as a service. If we're looking at that, VMRA, of course, we're going to be extracting indicators of compromise. We can pull out the command and control server. We can start blocking that in the firewall. Zero day exploits, behavioral analysis. Those open, this is a hard one for me to say, all this open source obfuscation tools. Horrible. Yeah, uh, go on to GitHub. I'm sure many of you have done this before, but search for obfuscation. You find the most amazing tools that people release free. Now, maybe you run one of them, your antivirus can sort of catch it. But what if you combine two or three? What if we maybe encode this DLL one way and we pack something else another way and so on and so forth? Remote working. This is another important reason why sandboxing, I think, has come the way it has. Prior to COVID, certainly the company I was working for, TLS decryption devices. And everyone's traffic goes through that and the company can see exactly what's going on. But of course, now everyone's working from home. Everything's changed. You're getting all these files that may be turning up, not you, 
but you're getting URLs that people are opening up, and no longer you're seeing these via your TLS decryption device. You're just sort of blind. So extracting all this information is so crucially important. And this was where I started off last summer. So going out with the sales team, meeting staff, meeting customers, having a chat, and realizing that actually there's a lot more to this than I had at first sort of understood. So, what's the first thing we sort of provide? Or what do people do with all this information? Automations and knowledge sharing. Again, previous to VMRay, you got an alert, blocked it, removed it. I've spoken to a few people today who talked about cleaning up after, say, an attack. And you'd go to a backup and maybe you'd scan it to make sure there's nothing there. However, the VMRay was all built around the idea of automations and knowledge sharing. So I would encourage all of you using sandboxes to go and have a look at where you can use this information that you're generating. Again, we come across a lot of customers who say, I've got a great sandbox, then we start talking about things like MISP. Uh, it's mentioned down at the bottom. MISP is an open source, a fantastic open source piece of software for intelligent sharing. Amazing. You can put your data in from anything, and you can take it out in any sort of format. And of course, suddenly, if you can start extracting command and control servers from your malware, well, let's push them onto the firewall. Let's block those IP addresses, because we definitely don't want anyone connecting to them. VMRay does a very good job of filtering the indicators of compromise. Now, let's pause a moment and let's think about this. If we're automating our sandboxing, if we're saying, right, Sentinel-1 or, or Microsoft Defender for Endpoint or any of these sort of EDR tools, send us all your false positives. Send us all your alerts, sorry. We're going to tell you if they're false positives. If we're going to automate such a process, well, what's the value in getting all those files in? Someone's still going to have to do something with the outcome. So, this is another important thing I want you to focus on when you're looking at sandboxes. The indicators of compromise. You'll notice I've highlighted two here. I'm going to have to get a little bit close. I might block some of this out, I'm afraid. Filter 409 artifacts. You just see it there, and then I turned it off here. VMRay, by default, filters out harmless artifacts. I'm not going to name names, but if any of you are familiar with sandboxes, there's a few on the market that will just dump out everything. Any IP address, anything that's been touched. Run DLL32, localhost. Let's imagine we block that. Can you imagine if you pushed out your EDR, block all connections to localhost? Or if you said, alert me. All of a sudden, this smart idea of automating just goes the opposite way. So again, when you're working with these systems, do have a look at what they're providing on the outcome. Now, I like VMRay because VMRay doesn't believe in vendor locking. So, MISP, Styx, and Taxi. Is anyone familiar with Styx, Taxi? Open source threat intelligence sharing. Styx is a protocol or the method of distributing, or I believe the data format, don't quote me, but Taxi is the server side. And those two systems together mean that companies can share this information either internally or far and wide. And of course, the final bit, what I spend so much of my time in as a sales engineer, solutions architect or whatever else you want to call me, the REST API. Um, we get customers that come to us saying that companies, other sandboxes, have weird integrations or specify what the data comes to. Again, what's the value of that sandbox? What VMRay is trying to do is, on the back end of all of this, actually provide some output that you can then feed into other systems to see the value of doing all of this. And like I said, automating it. Because if you put every alert your EDR solution gave, you're probably going to be very busy. So again, think about that flow in, but also the flow out. So this was something I had to learn the hard way. And like I said, spent an awful lot of time. Oh, give a review. Spent an awful lot of time dealing with scripting. The REST API, very easy to use, Python, PowerShell, but certainly having one of those available suddenly means you can integrate pretty much any product with anything else. So do focus on these open source standards when you're looking at such tools. I mentioned this website earlier, right? This came up in spring, our public threat feed. So this is something our company uh, 
tries to do to put something back into the community. And like I said earlier, uh, I'm not a salesperson, I'm technical, and I'm promising you there is no sign-up required to have a look at that. You will get to go and have a look at the threats, and I would recommend you do it. Let's jump on, though. Ah, spring. This reminds me of a lot of fun. So Microsoft, February 2023, they announced they're going to start blocking macros, right? How many times has someone had one of those Word documents turn up, blurry text, click enable editing to make this, you know, make this document open in your new version? Unfortunately, people still fall for it. So Microsoft made the bold decision, let's stop macros. Sorry, I shouldn't clap when I'm wearing a microphone. Let's, stop, let's turn off black, uh, block macros by default when a file comes from the internet. Fantastic. April, Microsoft OneNote starts appearing packed with all sorts of rubbish. This was not surprising, I hate to say it, because of course anyone we work in security, these things come and go all the time. But what did shock me about this is quite how quickly all these attackers move from Word documents full of macros instead to OneNotes with all sorts. We were seeing MSI files, VB scripts, ISO files being dropped. The ISO files is a really weird one. I would recommend you have a dig through the threat feed to find some of these samples. 7-zip, it turns out, uh, and there was another bug in Windows at the time, meant that read-only, I think it was a read-only file, wouldn't get this mark of the web. I've got it on the next one. So a mark of the web, if anyone's ever seen that little box, see that security? Came from a computer. You have to click unblock. Unfortunately, it wasn't there for one note at one point. So you can imagine what happened there. And that's why this sort of sudden flood of information came in. And again, uh, maybe I'm being a little bit um, ju junior, maybe let's say, a bit basic. But personally, I would have thought if Microsoft turned it off for one, they would have done it for everything. Wasn't the case. Right, OK, sandboxing. This is another important one. How many of them have OCR? You know, I mentioned earlier about documents trying to trick people. That's a, a, a relatively small screenshot, but it's that classic blurry text background. Again, you'll notice there, go and have a look at our threat feed. The ability to catch, you know, an OCR engine uh, in the product, an optical character recognition, of course, suddenly you can start approaching all the social engineering attacks. So this attack is the old, you know, it's a blurry document, please click on the following, enable editing, and then let the macros run, and of course the payload is triggered. It's strange, but we're seeing more and more of these through a variety of different things, a variety of different methods, social engineering attacks, get the user to run it. So if you're able to do this sort of OCR, optical character recognition, hopefully your sandbox will be able to make the most of what it's actually seeing. And of course, screenshots, got to have screenshots. Um, so many of these files are visual. Uh, I would say malware that we've been seeing, or I've been seeing in the last year, you could split it right down the middle. There are the executables, DLLs, things like that, that want to run in the background, encrypt stuff, and then they tell you that they're there. But of course, anything that's targeting your end users is probably going to need a social engineering attack first. So, factor that in when you're having a look at this stuff. Not working. <laughs> I mean, at least it's memorable. Now, right. So, let's go back to a bit more technical stuff, right? Cat B. This is a particularly horrible piece of malware. Um, I've got some more sort of stuff uh, I can discuss with you later if you're interested, but Cat B has this interesting thing of putting ransom notes on top of the files. So when you open the file in a hex editor, you'll actually see the ransom note above the encrypted blob of data that's left where your old documents used to be. But you'll also notice here, we are specifically, like I said earlier, we are seeing a lot of attacks. This one here, sideloading, uh, we're seeing an awful lot of things where they're trying to detect the analysis environments. Now, I said this at the beginning, I'm laboring this point perhaps, but Cat B is a very, very active piece of malware that's out there. Um, that link, another, there is no registration required, anything like that. And this is one of our threat researchers, a guy called Patrick Stubman, does fantastic work, the most amazing stuff. I'm quite certain he wrote it, or certainly his team. 
writes the most amazing stuff, and I would strongly recommend you go and have a look at these. If you're curious about malware analysis, he goes into the details. He opens it up, pulls it apart, shows you all the different functions, and so on and so forth, and he goes through cap B. Now, let's go back to VMware and what VMware as a company specifically did. We hit spring, they start repackaging it. You might think I'm about to start going down the sales route, but this is important to understand how these files, how these systems work. A lot of sandboxes, a lot of these sort of cloud-based scanning tools, again, you've got a quota. By spring, I'd already seen about three users come to us and say, oh my god, I need like double the quota now. We're being hit by an attack. This I would categorize under cybersecurity planning. We get an awful lot of people come and discuss with us on a sandbox. We have on average 50 files a month. Don't think about the average month. Think about what happens when something is going to go wrong. Because that's when a tool like this is really going to start delivering value, as I said, to be able to export all that information and to be able to import files into it. Hands-free automation, again, with a quota, you're kind of stuck. Because as I was thinking about, you could have users, potentially a malicious person, could almost deny of service one of your security tools. Let's say your sandbox allows for 100 detonations a month. If I was mean enough and I pushed 100 variations of the same file through your system, well, you've just run out of quota. So, interestingly enough, this is something which really did bother me. And when they started talking about repackaging, I kind of switched off, if I'm honest. But yeah, you can't really automate all of this stuff if you've got a quota. You can't scan any files till the first of the next month. No one cares when the billing month happens. Attackers aren't going to stop. So, again, strange that no one sort of considered that. In summer, we added Linux support. Now, Linux, um, under Linux, we're scanning ELF files. What are they? Executable and linkable formats, aka binaries. Linux binaries. Think of them as executables for Linux. Um, anyone read about freedownloadmanager.org? This was in the press recently. No, I'm not seeing any head shakes. Right, here's an interesting one. So we had a few customers come to us and say, why would we scan ELF files? All our software is in RPM and DEB files and things like that. Right. Freedownloadmanager.org. Go onto this website. You could, for years, I believe it was, about three or four years, you'd be able to go on there, download their free download manager, and run it. And they had about four or five different servers that were offering up the files. One of those servers was offering up a package that contained an ELF binary. Now, of course, you're not going to package your nasty Linux ransomware, as we've got a screenshot of it there, in a dev file. You can open them up. You can unpackage those. You need a binary to be able to smuggle stuff in. If you're not keeping an eye out for ELF files, um, personally, if you haven't got a sandbox, these are appearing at a rate of knots. Don't underestimate how much of a target Linux is starting to become for attackers. And again, malware. I started using Linux you know, decades ago, and everyone was ranting around, it's brilliant, it's harder to use, but oh, you get to laugh at all the Windows people with antivirus and things like that. Yeah, it's coming everyone's way now. This is the final slide I'm going to do to round off this triumphant majesty of a talk. Amaday. Here's another horrible example of why malware sandbox is so incredibly valuable. First appeared in 2018, so this isn't news, and you've probably heard of this family of malware before. It steals information, sits there, you know, usernames, passwords, this kind of wonderful stuff, sends it across the internet to their command and control servers. Analysis now suggests it can be used to drop other payloads. Maybe the attackers are basically upgrading their backdoors. So if they've had this previously installed, maybe they're worried that people are going to spot it, so they're removing it. But equally, some things that we've seen could also suggest that people are sort of overtaking one another's command and control servers. So no longer do you have to worry about a piece of malware coming from something legitimate. Now it's almost like malware is just spinning off more and more malware. I also put a note down there about sanitizing URLs. VMray, we have a reputational lookup in the product. It's the first round of analysis. What's great about the reputational lookup we can quickly you know, count off a lot of different files. If it's something that's been doing the rounds for three years, why bother scanning it? If we know it's bad, you know, on you go. 
you can send URLs. Maybe we should all consider what's being sent in those. For example, this is the payload. This is the URL that's being sent back with this Amade Stealer. And again, there's a blog post if you can go and have a look at it there. What's interesting about all of this, that's the version number of the malware, that's the computer name, that's the username, and the final bit DM, that would be the domain name. Right, OK, we don't want that being sent to the attackers, I get that. We get an awful lot of people submitting URLs. We go to sales calls and people will say, oh, my, my staff have been using you know, product X, Y, and Z. It's free. What happens to your data when you upload it? I mean, these kind of URLs, occasionally we see sort of articles turn up with uh, common, oh, you know, uh, uh, let's say antivirus websites where you can upload a file and it's scanned by sort of 100 different engines. I'm not going to name names. But we occasionally see information like this being leaked out of that. Because, of course, if you roughly know maybe the hash or you know what you're looking for, to go routing through those kind of publicly available logs, imagine if you found a URL like this. Some poor guy has been hacked. Maybe he thought he was doing the right thing by uploading the binary to a free sandbox. And then this gets published on the internet. Right. <sighs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, may I turn it over for any questions? I'd like to see one. In fact, I'm not going to let anyone go until I get at least one question. <laughs> you, sir, how was the apple? It was, it's good, yeah. How, well, how do you feel about yours, malware? I guess. What's that, sorry? Better than yours, uh, I guess. I don't know. I think it, felt, it went well in the end, but it did shake me up a little bit. It knocked, you know, when it's like public speaking is a nightmare. You start going and it knocks you off and it falls all over the place. Let me put it this way. Threatfeed.vmray.com. If I've done nothing else today, please go and visit our website. No sign up, just go and have a look. Second of all, there's my details. Come look me up on LinkedIn. Come and ping me at VMray. Come and talk to me. I promise you, the product's much better than the public speaking. Um, <laughs> if there are no questions, then we can wrap up the session. But I will say I'm a little disappointed. No one, can I actually ask? Can I just see a, 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 if you can? I'm just curious. Anyone here use a sandbox? No. You see, it's an interesting one. Well, this gentleman. It's a real interesting one. As I said, when I started, I wasn't aware of how many companies use it. When you look at a product like Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, it's great, it's cheap, its analysis isn't fantastic. And then, of course, what do you get from an alert? You had a farm. I removed it. So tools like this suddenly become this sort of engine to supercharge. So hopefully, hopefully, if nothing else, you've had a laugh. But I would hope that maybe a few of you have been inspired to go and have a look at sandboxing and have a dig around that. No further questions? Right, we'll leave it there. It's not going to get any better. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>